Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. If you are the parent of a school-aged child or maybe a teenager, it's a good idea to do everything you can to keep them healthy. I mean, you don't want to miss school. You want them to miss school, right? How exactly am I supposed to do that? <laughs> well, here to tell us is Mayo Clinic infectious disease expert, Dr. Napuni Rajapaski. Dr. Pa- Dr. Roger Roger Boxy. Boxy. Yes, Dr. it's Roger good to Boxy. have you back. Good to have you. Great, thanks. It's great to be back. <laughs> How do you keep kids healthy during the school year? So I know it's easier said than done. They spent the whole summer kind of being active, being outside, usually with fewer infections. But as soon as they hit the classroom, it seems like every kid starts to get sick. Back that happened. into the Petri dish. Exactly. <laughs> so that happens for a number of reasons. Uh, one is that you have a lot of kids in a relatively confined area or a small space, which really facilitates the transmission of different infections uh, between all of them. And so there are a few things that we can do to help to try and keep them healthy. Probably the most simple or basic one, but the most effective is hand washing. So give us, give us some tips. How do, yeah. you, how do you wash your hands? So it can be difficult, especially with kids who are very busy doing lots of different other important things during the day to teach them how to wash their hands properly. But it is something that's worth doing a little refresher on before they go back into the classroom. Yeah, let's pretend that it's only kids <laughs> that have a problem remembering <laughs> how to wash true, their actually, hands correctly. Yes. And you know what? I just have to say how interesting that the number one thing is washing hands. So it really is, we laugh about it, but it really is that important. Exactly, yeah, it is probably the single most effective way to keep yourself uh, healthy along with vaccination. Okay, so how do we do it? So uh, in terms of washing your hands, so one of the first questions that comes up is whether people should use soap and water or the alcohol-based hand rubs. Um, There are definitely situations where soap and water is preferable. Uh, The first is if you have a visible soiling of your hands with dirt or grease or something like that. Um, The alcohol-based hand rubs are not very effective in that situation. So soap and water preferred in that situation. The second situation is with uh, most diarrheal illnesses. Mm Um, So there are some types of viruses, especially things like norovirus, which is uh, the most common cause of stomach flu now, um, where soap and water is more effective than the alcohol-based hand rubs. Aside from that, um, using whatever you have on hand is uh, fine. Um, And the most important thing is just to make sure that whatever you're using, you're using it properly. So the biggest thing for uh, soap and water is uh, to use enough soap that you get a good lather on all surfaces of your hands. And using either cold or warm water, using hot water is not any more effective and generally leads to more um, irritation of the skin. And so Mm -hmm. using a Water temperature that's comfortable um, for you is recommended. Cold water is okay? Cold water is okay. Um, Cold or warm water is usually what we recommend. Um, And then the other key is to make sure that you wash them for long enough and that you scrub all the different surfaces of your hands well. And what is long enough? Yeah, so long enough (laughs) usually is uh, somewhere between 50 to 30 seconds has been found to be kind of the most effective duration of time. And so uh, if you want a little trick, it's if you hum happy birthday to yourself twice, at the usual speed, you should land somewhere around the 22nd uh, mark. Except when you're using oil-based paint. Have you ever washed your hands for 30 seconds, Ms. Tracy? No, I'm not interested in it. <laughs> I, I, I try to not use oil-based paint because of that. Yeah. Well, 15 <laughs> seconds is even stretching it. Don't yeah. you think? So it is a, tends to be a bit longer than you think mm-hmm. when you start to really count out the time. But um, those are the lengths of time that have been found to be most effective for uh, clearing any infectious particles from your hands. Common areas that people miss when they're washing their hands. So under their nails, the backs of the hands, and in between your fingers are kind of the big areas to focus on and make sure that you're, you're hitting. Germ prevention. Yes. Uh, and okay, so let's talk about uh, the flu specifically. Um, are you a vaccine proponent, I assume? So yes, I most definitely am a vaccine proponent along with hand washing. Uh, vaccination is the next uh, most effective way to prevent uh, many types of infections. And so we definitely advocate for flu vaccine for everyone over six months of age. Is it required for kids to get to go to school? Uh, it depends on which uh, state you live in, and um, here currently there's no requirement that I'm aware of, but it will vary depending on where, where kids go. 
All right. Tell us how to cough and sneeze properly. <laughs> yeah. So the concept of cough etiquette is uh, very important, especially going back to school. Um, another good thing to kind of refresh your kids on before they uh, hit the classroom. Uh, cough etiquette refers to uh, coughing either into a tissue or into the sleeve of your uh, clothing um, instead of coughing directly um, onto your hands and your fingers. Um, because when you do that, you are at h much higher risk of spreading uh, infectious particles. I like calling it the vampire cough. Yeah. Because you put your arm up and you cough into that like a vampire would. <laughs> oh, did you, you know, know how I that, am? Roger Pax I have not uh, yes. heard that term before, but uh, <laughs> there's the dab now that is like the a really dab. popular move with kids. And so oh, we here try we go and use again. that. To we tried to teach him how to do the dab. <laughs> it failed, yeah. failed miserably, so, so don't worry about it. You can, well, you you can try that if yeah, they're fans of dabbing. He's <laughs> been practicing. <laughs> So tell us um, when your child uh, becomes ill, uh, when, how do you know when to keep them home from school and how do you know when it's okay for them to go back? Sure. So um, there's a couple of important concepts here. One is that certain schools or daycares may have their own rules or guidelines about um, children who can attend school when they have various types of symptoms. So it's important to know what the rules are at your child's specific school or daycare center. But in terms of general guidance to parents that we offer, um, kids who are actively having fever, uh, generally it's best to keep them home for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that they're probably not feeling well enough to participate or really get much out of going to school um, when they're that sick, and so it's worthwhile keeping them at home. Fever would be how high? How high would your temperature so be? So you... above 100, okay. I would consider, but that can vary in different situations. Um, the other thing is they may be contagious, so sending them to school when they have fever and an infection might cause risk to other uh, children, and you never know who else is in the classroom. There may be kids who have weakened immune systems um, or things like that in the classroom, and so you don't want to be exposing people unnecessarily to infections. When you're talking about kids feeling crummy, if they have a sore throat, how bad does a sore throat have to hurt before you take in to see if it's strep throat? So uh, that dis differentiation doesn't uh, depend so much on how much pain they're having, but on a couple of different things. So probably more than 90% of sore throats in kids are actually caused by viruses. Meaning um, antibiotics will not help. Exactly. So antibiotics are of no benefit to someone with a viral infection and will not help them feel better any faster and certainly can cause uh, side effects or um, issues if you take them unnecessarily. Um, the things that we look for to decide whether a child might have strep throat and might benefit from a throat swab um, include, so having fever, obviously sore throat, throat pain, uh, enlargement of the lymph nodes that live in the front of the neck, and the absence of symptoms of a viral infection, so cough, runny nose. If you have those, much more likely that you have a virus and not strep throat. Um, you can't tell by looking at someone's throat whether they have strep, a bacterial infection, or a viral infection. They can look identical. And so if a physician suspects that a child has strep throat, um, the only way to prove it or disprove it is to take a throat swab. And so it's very important that that's done before any antibiotics are uh, prescribed so you can confirm the diagnosis. And you can get the result back pretty quickly now, can't you? Yeah, so now we have uh, rapid tests for strep. You can get the results back within a few minutes to an hour within the... Um, clinic itself. Um, but if that test is negative, often they are sent for a full, uh, what we call bacterial culture, uh, to confirm whether there is actually strep bacteria there or not. We have 60 seconds left. Let's talk about head lice. <laughs> sure. I'd rather not, but let's do it. Yes. How do you know when your child has head lice? So uh, head lice is a common infection in kids. I kind of categorize it amongst nuisance infections and not necessarily harmful. So I think that's the first thing for parents really to know is that these uh, parasites that can live on the scalp, they don't transmit any dangerous um, infections. It's but they gross. can be a nuisance to get yes. rid of. <laughs> Symptoms that a child might have, most commonly we see um, an itchy scalp. They may complain of a sensation of their hair moving or uh, something moving on their head. And you may actually just see the <laughs> lice themselves crawling around, which is the other way that they usually come to attention. Ew. All right. <laughs> Hold on. And then what There's do you do more? to treat it? Well, because what people like to do is just put mayonnaise on their head and think it's done, but that, I know that's not the way to treat it. Yeah, so we do have uh, quite effective treatments for head lice, most of which are topical, so they're applied to the hair. Uh, some of them are available over the counter, which means you don't need to get a doctor's prescription in order to use them. Um, if you do uh, use one of those on your child, it's important to read the instructions uh, 
properly and carefully um, to make sure that you apply it uh, in the way that it's prescribed. Also, you don't want their hair to fall out. That's right. No. <laughs> also, in kids under two years of age, it's worth visiting your primary care provider um, because many of these products are not um, safe to use in young kids. All right. Pediatric infectious disease specialist, Dr. Napuni Rajapaski. Everyone wants their kids to be healthy and stay healthy, and now you know how. From a Mayo Clinic infectious disease expert, thanks for joining us, Dr. Rajapaksi. Thanks for having me.